Pretty ball. So, um, last week we talked about marriage and the great expectations that we have and the great burden we put on others. That burden is the idea that someone else can make me perfectly happy or that in someone else I can find perfect love. And the reality is if we expect that from a fallible human being then we are being completely unrealistic and we are therefore sure to become unhappy. Does that sound like um, a bummer or what? It's the truth and our problem is in this age in which we live we are so adverse to the truth we want to live in selfie land selfie land with all of the wonderful apps that make our bodies look fantastic more fantastic than they really are and we try to pretend we're having such an incredible time when really it's not that big a deal, it's fun, it's okay, but it's not like, you know, hello. <laughs> and we're just like going for it in this time and age. And it is extremely unfortunate. And it is no wonder that there is a corresponding rise in depression and suicide. Because we are creating such unrealistic expectations. Instead of being very realistic about life and the nature of life. And where happiness and love is actually going to be found. So... A continuation on that theme is in search of a soulmate. You know, when people first started using this term, it was more or less became kind of popular during the heavy New Agey time. And at that time, it was kind of like a little bit what? <laughs> a little bit strange, but people kind of got used to it and have really gone with it. This idea that somewhere out there is the perfect person for me. Well, the good news is that is true but not in the way that you think. Another person like yourself cannot bring you the complete fulfillment, satisfaction and happiness that you actually seek and desire. As I've mentioned many times before, we live in a really different time. There's this massive social experiment going on. It started in about 1920, where they introduced many of the ideas that are prevalent now in, in advertising that have to do with the manipulation of the minds of masses of people 
and creating desire. This was not something that people thought about or were focused on or interested in. And it began in, in the mid-1920s and has accelerated to such a degree that we see a recent interview of the first president of Facebook and he is boasting about how good they are at manipulating the general public. How to give them these little rewards that become like dopamine hits, like rewards for addicts. This is the kind of terminology that is used in these circles where you dangle something, get everybody excited, anticipating, then you give them a little rush and then you drop them and then you offer them something else. I mean, this theory or idea is, is really been in vogue now for what, 80 years, 90 years. It's, you know, prior to this period and even into the beginning part of this period, people lived differently and they had different expectations than we do now. We don't realize that when we look back at history, the way we look at history, we are seeing it through a lens of the current time and our, the way that we think, our value systems and everything. We look back and we try to make, we do make judgments, we do try to analyze things, but it's actually not really open and honest and truthful. Since time immemorial, the system of life that was promoted within the Vedas, the Vedas are the most ancient of all spiritual and religious texts. Not only are they the most ancient, they are profound and they are incredibly complete and even complex. And they provide a direction in life. And it is founded upon my purpose. My purpose in life, the purpose that I will develop, always is founded upon my idea of who I am. The idea of who I am, from that then flows what will make me happy, what should I be doing, what is the highest degree of perfection that I can expect or experience, what's the greatest thing that can happen to me. It's all founded on this first idea of who I am. In the modern world, knowledge of the soul or the spiritual component is practically non-existent. People have become so absorbed in this body that we are temporarily occupying. Hey, get used to it. This is a temporary situation. You had a birth within this body. This body grows and develops and it wanes and you will have to leave. Everybody does. Everybody. Death is the only thing that you can be 100% sure is going to happen to you in this life. Nothing else is sure. This one thing is sure. So this time in between my birth, when I show up in this body, and the time when I get kicked out of it, this thing that I call life is not really life. 
It's just like a, a time period where I am occupying this body. The problem is then I, I get like so overwhelmed. Not only do I have no idea whatsoever who I am and what am I doing here. I can't find the happiness and perfection I seek when my search is based on false ideas. Since ancient time there was this profound understanding that this time that we spend in these bodies should be used very wisely. If you want to be happy in the time that you spend in this body, you must make, learn to make really good choices. How's life working out for you? If your life is a bummer or unpleasant or sad or there's difficulties, your experience is the result of choices that you have made and actions that you have taken. It's nobody else's fault. I can't blame anybody else. I am where I am because of my own decisions and choices. And so learning to live within this world and in this life, this experience, and making it so it's not going to be a bummer, and you think things are bad wherever you are now, wait for the last moments that you spend in this body. That's like, <laughs> that's, oh boy, this guy's so depressing. Why are you talking about this? <laughs> no, we're seeking to escape the depression with the torchlight of knowledge. You know, this desire that we have when we look for a soulmate, a partner, somebody who will actually complete my life and make me feel whole, where I will really find happiness, hopefully a very wonderful love. This desire, this search, actually comes from the soul itself. This is part of your eternal spiritual nature. But what happens is we get so overwhelmed by this current life and our experience in this body. And I look at my body and, and, and this is me. And then I think that these needs and desires have arisen from my body or my mind. And by engaging in physical experience or mental experience, I will find happiness. The answer is no, it doesn't work like that. Your body just receives stimulation of different sorts, your mind receives stimulation, and after it's all over, you're left just as empty as before. It doesn't have to be this way. You know, we're talking about in search of a soulmate. Then we get a subtitle, it's a yoga thing. This is unfortunately a forgotten part of what the actual yoga process was about. The yoga process is really about this amazing and wonderful inward journey. Right now our journey is out, outside of our body. We feel empty inside or unhappy or lacking love. And so we look outside of our body for something or someone that we can grab hold of and pull close and cuddle up with 
and think that that is really going to fill the void inside. It doesn't. All it does is distract you for a while. It diverts your attention for a while. Eventually, the emptiness, the void, is again and again experienced. The ancient yogis, since, since time immemorial, they had this intense awareness about this. And they sought to undertake an inward journey to actually find their soulmate. Wow, what are you talking about? <laughs> In the, uh, there's a beautiful description in the um, Mundaka Upanishad, actually in two of the Upanishads there is the same um, description. And what it does is talk about who you are and what's going on. Firstly, the body is not you. It is something that you, you, the person, a spiritual being, are temporarily occupying. And they use this analogy of like a bird in a tree. But they say that within each tree, meaning within each body, there are actually two birds. One bird is busily engaged in trying to enjoy the fruits of this tree, hopping from branch to branch, trying to enjoy so many things. But there is a second bird who is simply standing there waiting for that first bird to turn and recognize his eternal friend. This is not some fantasy or this is not just some really poetic analogy this is a spiritual reality the living being you the person are described in some yoga text as being purusha purusha literally means person but there is another terminology, it is called, it is Atma. Atma, it literally means the self. So these two birds, one is the Aparusha or Atma. The other one is called Param Atma or Param Purusha. This Param means supreme, the supreme self or the supreme person. This feature was what the yogis pursued. I would just read, um, is this too cosmic or we're okay with this? No, no, this is, actually this is super cool. The Lord and the living entity are compared to two birds sitting in a tree. And while the illusioned living entity eats the fruits of the material world, the Lord, as the supreme soul and best friend, witnesses these activities. And although the two birds are in the same tree, the eating bird, or the jiva, is fully engrossed with anxiety and moroseness as the enjoyer of the fruits of the tree. However, if in some way or other he turns to his friend, the Lord, and knows his spiritual glory, the suffering bird becomes immediately free from all 
anxieties. This, you know, as I stated before, you are a spiritual being. You are not unlimited. You are not infinite in the greatest sense. In your attempt to become fulfilled, to fill up the emptiness, if you seek another <coughs> person who is in the same situation as yourself, it's not going to work. It's not going to do it. And this is why in the practice of the mystic yoga system or Ashtanga Yoga, all of the activities like engaging in asana, following the regulations, yama, niyama, engaging in pranayama, Pratyahara, Dharana, Dhyan, meditation, was for the purpose of being able to engage, to shut off and engage in this inward journey in search of this Lord of my own heart, my actual soulmate, the one whom I, when I discover it will be so overwhelming, the experience. It is like a spiritual volcano of intense and profound happiness and ecstasy. The yogis, having had this experience, then sought nothing else. They became completely absorbed. In modern times, um, the great, or oh, the renowned um, Krishnamacharya, who is practically the father of modern yoga as it's experienced in the Western world, he himself was a genuine yogi. Yogi because this union that I am speaking of, this union with the Supreme can be experienced in actually three different ways. One form of union is a union with an unlimited ocean of spiritual existence, an impersonal feature, an effulgence, an impersonal feature of the highest truth. That provides limitless bliss. But for one who has actually encountered this personality who actually accompanies us on our sojourn through the material world, sitting within our heart of hearts, for one who has had this experience, they have no attraction to this feature of this of Brahman, of this spiritual effulgence. From the Bhagavad Purana, there is another verse. By manipulating a fire generating stick, great saints and sages can bring forth the fire lying dormant within wood. It's like what are they talking about? I mean, just the, the way in which these people looked at the world was amazing. When they saw wood, they didn't just see a piece of wood. They knew that fire was residing <coughs> within that wood. You know, when somebody lights a fire, okay, where did the fire came, come from? Oh, it came from a match. No. The fire on a match is like this big. And we're talking about, where does this fire come from? 
and it's understood to be residing within wood or material that is flammable. This element is there and under certain conditions it is brought forward and so this example has been used. In the same way as the sages or yogis could make fire manifest from wood, in the same way those expert in understanding the absolute truth try to see you in everything, even within their own bodies. Yet you remain concealed. You are not to be understood by indirect processes involving mental or physical activity. Because you are self-manifested, only when you see that a person is wholeheartedly engaged in searching for you, do you reveal yourself. And therefore, I offer my respectful obeisance unto you, O Lord. So here we have a, an amazing revelation you know, most people think that I am going to achieve things of relevance and importance by my strength, by my worthiness, by my ability. People think this in relation to God in whatever way they think of Him. That I must become good, I must become worthy, I must be deserving, I must be accomplished. This path is a very difficult, arduous, and painful path that rarely delivers any goods. The process that has been spoken here of is what is described as rather than ascending, trying to climb by your own strength, a descending process where one of the really important things is that a person recognize their own deficiencies. That I am weak. I am not all powerful and strong. I am not self-sufficient. And in a mood of tremendous humility, you know, it's such a bummer that in the world today, humility is like discarded as a worthless thing. In fact, it is people think that if you are very humble, you're weak. And I should be able to just push you aside. We have lost this appreciation that actual humility is a huge and important requirement for a person to able come to the point of succeeding in their spiritual journey. This humility. And it speaks here in this verse that when a person is sincere, when they are a sincere seeker, a humble seeker, then they will have realization. They will have the spiritual experience. Krishna Macharya, before he died, he wrote a beautiful poem, um, Yog Anjali Shram, which means like the offering of yoga, Anjali's this offering. And one of the verses, he describes what happens when the yogi is finally able to witness this Paramatma, the Supreme Self. 
how it induces an overwhelming experience of spiritual ecstasy and happiness. All the things that we are hoping for, I mean, wedding day, you know, and people practice so hard to make the wedding so perfect and they get every clothes right and everything and then just they want to have the right poses and the right situation and somebody to capture that moment for all eternity it will be my happy moment no it's gone it's past and it was fake you just set it up it might be a really nice person that you're marrying that's okay but it's not the perfection that you're looking for the spiritual experience in actually discovering who is our true and eternal soulmate and relinking up again will provide a person with an experience of unimaginable and ecstatic love and happiness. The very thing that we have been hankering for. And it is so sad and unfortunate that this is a forgotten quest. In the big noise that is yoga today where everybody's totally absorbed in asana like it's everything. And it's just like a tiny little part of yoga. Is really unfortunate and where people use it to sort of like you know they want to build a beautiful body so that they can attract others and hopefully find that love okay you can build a beautiful body how's it going to be when you're about 75 or 80 still may be strong and okay but i'm sorry long gone <laughs> long gone everything is headed south big time and it's like we're in this constant battle to regain youthfulness guess what you the spiritual being the eternal atma are eternally youthful <laughs> that's why you hanker for it and that's why it's so disturbing when your body's aging and if you think that this is the sum total of who you are, you are going to have a life of tremendous unhappiness. Get over it. Get beyond it. This is not who you are. You are the person within, the spiritual being. And if you can reestablish your lost connection with this feature of the Absolute known as Paramatma, who resides within the heart of all living beings, you will again find your soulmate. You will taste a happiness and a form of love that is... Now, now we're talking, yes, and they lived happily ever after. Because <laughs> you know what? The Atma doesn't die. It goes on living. This is life. The body is not alive. There is no life that comes from the body. The life that is experienced in the body is because of the presence of a spiritual being that is so powerful, that presence, that this body appears to be alive. As soon as that person leaves, this thing just falls over and becomes immediately repulsive. Like... <laughs> Anything that you can see, even with limited vision, in another person being attractive, or nice, or someone I want to be connected with, this is some little recognition actually of some spiritual component not in the body but then we just spent my god how much money gets spent on body hair makeup nails clothes dressing it up there's a massive industry supporting this illusion and we're just going along for the ride 
Well, the news is the yoga process is about not going along for the ride, but actually beginning an amazing inward journey that is not lonely. It is incredibly wonderful. And when the more a person grows in their understanding of their own spiritual identity, the more healthy their relationships become in this world. We recognize <laughs> that this person is not going to fulfill all of my needs. Does that mean I shouldn't love them? Absolutely not. I recognize them to be spiritual beings that I should love and care for. Now, all of a sudden, relationships shift from what am I getting out of it to what can I do for this person? It becomes more about giving rather than taking. Relationships become pure, spiritualized, healthy. And they are built on this understanding and they are built upon me seeking my inner spiritual satisfaction in my relationship with the Lord of my own heart and my assisting a partner, a friend, a child, a parent, assisting them in that same journey. And then everything becomes like, Wow, really wonderful, really wonderful. Now you have healthy relationships, you have productive relationships, you have respectful relationships. Okay, I'm going to stop now, otherwise I'll get into trouble. Oh wow, I went over time. I'm already in trouble. I hope nobody's upset I went over time. I think it's important. Do you think it's important? Or not? It's kind of like... <laughs> okay, for those who didn't, weren't sure, and we'll just chant a little bit. This process of meditation using spiritual sound is the primary means to bring about spiritual realization and to assist us and aid us on this spiritual journey. When we engage in this form of meditation upon <laughs> spiritual sound, we can come to experience actual perfection, actual happiness and love. So, I'll... Yeah, okay, I'll chant uh, this Maha Mantra again.
हरि हरिभो